Hi, good morning, everyone, and um, thank you, Meg. Uh, welcome to this talk on Black Flags and Red Lines, the untold story of the most daring disarmament feat of modern times. I'm very appreciative to family friend and author Joby Wark for agreeing to speak today, and I'm pleased to introduce him now. Joby Wark is a best-selling author and a national security correspondent for the Washington Post. A two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, he served for 24 years with the Post's national and investigative staffs, reporting from Washington and scores of cities around the world. In addition to his latest book, Redline, he is the author of two previous nonfiction books, including The Triple Agent, which our book club has just uh, read, a uh, very good book, a New York Times bestseller about a CIA operation in Afghanistan, as well as Black Flags, which was published in 2015, a narrative account of the personalities and events that gave rise to the Islamic State. Black Flags was listed as one of the best books of 2015 by the New York Times, the Washington Post, the San Francisco Chronicle, and numerous other publications, and was the recipient of the 2016 Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction. In more than two decades as a Washington Post reporter, Bork has written extensively on topics ranging from Middle East conflicts and terrorism to nuclear proliferation and climate change. His articles about, um, sorry, illicit weapons trafficking won the Overseas Press Club of America's Bob Considine Award for the best newspaper interpretation of international affairs. Before coming to the Post, Joby was an investigative reporter for the News and Observer of Raleigh, North Carolina, where he co-authored Boss Hog, a series of stor stories that documented the political and environmental fallout caused by factory farming in the Southeast. The series won the 1996 Gold Medal Pulitzer Prize for public service and nine other national and regional awards. Prior to that, he was a foreign correspondent for United Press International in Eastern Europe, where he covered the collapse of communism in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Joby graduated summa cum laude from Temple University in 1982 with a BA in journalism. A native of North Carolina, he has two adult children and lives in the Virginia suburbs of Washington, DC. Um, welcome, Joby. Well, thank you very much, Shannon. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And Meg, thank you for setting everything up so beautifully. Um, a big thanks to the whole Ollie staff, but especially to Shannon uh, for the invitation. If you know Shannon, you know she's an incredible person, but she also happens to be the mother of a very gifted young man who was uh, my research assistant uh, for my last book, Red Line, at the Wilson Center. And it was through her son, Sean, that I was able to meet Shannon and her amazing family, and that's been a special treat for me. So again, thanks to all of you for taking time out of your day to learn about a subject that's not particularly pleasant or easy, but it's important. And I think you'll come away from today's talk with a deeper understanding and appreciation of why Sirius is so important and why it matters, including for us here in the United States. Now, first about me, I'm not a lecturer and maybe that's quickly obvious, but I am an author of a special kind in the sense that I, I my niche is narrative nonfiction. And for me, that means foremost, I'm a journalist um, of the old fashioned variety. And that's really my calling. And if you read my book, you see I don't make arguments or advocate for certain policies or politics, but my books try to present facts and context as much as possible so the reader can make up its own uh, decision, an informed decision. And in my personal experience throughout my career, I found that the most effective way to explain a complicated situation is through stories. Because as human beings, we're drawn to stories and to characters, especially characters we can relate to. And as far as my own personal experience as a reader, stories about people that are real, characters that are real, are even more fascinating because they're real, because the events really happened. And these are the kinds of stories I tell in my book. My second book, for example, which Shannon mentioned, was about ISIS, the Islamic State. But it's really the story of an individual, a very screwed up, tortured, complex Jordanian man who becomes the founder of a group called Al Qaeda in Iraq, which later becomes known as ISIS. And if you read the book, you'll see that the central character is a horrible human being, but you come to understand why he makes the decisions that he makes and why ISIS became this brutal, bloodthirsty organization that we see in the news today. 
and you'll understand how we as Americans created perfect opportunities for him again and again, giving him the war he always wanted and giving him a platform for spreading his ideas and winning recruits. Now, today I'll talk mostly about my new book, Red Line, which contains a pretty dramatic narrative, which again, is all true and pretty scary at times. And as you follow the, the narrative, you'll begin to understand why the Syrian war, this conflict that we see in the news that we'd like to tune out as Americans, is truly one of the most consequential crises of our time. One that has given birth to so many problems from instability in the Middle East, to the ascendancy of Russia as a global air adversary, to the rise of the Islamic State and all its horrors, to the human waves of refugees that have destabilized European governments and spurred a kind of nativist, anti-immigrant populism that's undermining democratic institutions around the globe. That's huge. And the nations and institutions of the West did not see this crisis coming. And when it happened, they could not manage to stop it or contain it. And the complicated reasons for that become clear in my book. Now it's against this backdrop, gloomy as it is, that another crisis begins to unfold, starting in late 2012 and early 2013, about two years after the Syrian uprising starts. And it's this second crisis that becomes the core narrative of my book, Red Line. And in a way, it's a story about a disaster that didn't happen. It's a story about an amazing group of characters, Americans, Europeans, Canadians, some Syrian activists, all of them courageous, all of them very real, who found themselves in Syria in the middle of a civil war, basically trying to defuse a time bomb, a threat that was aimed at the West and could very well have changed history if it had not been stopped. Unless you've read the book, there's a good chance you've heard very little about it. So what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is set the stage for the story I tell in the book. I'm going to introduce some of the characters, and we're going to travel along with them so you get a sense of what they were like and why their actions proved to be so important, even if most Americans will never know their names. At its core, this is also a story about American ingenuity in response to a crisis. And some of the book's heroes are found in places where you might not expect to see them, including deep inside the bureaucracy of the U.S. government and even at the United Nations. So hold on to your seats for that. I think you'll be as impressed for these, uh, by these personalities as I was. I'm gonna show you a few photos as we talk so you can get a virtual sense of the people and places. And I think you can probably see that now. And we're going to start our story in a laboratory. And it's not any laboratory, it's a military research facility whose purpose is to create a weapon of mass destruction for Syria's dictator. Now, a bit of context here, Syria's arch rival, as you probably know, it's, its neighbor Israel, has fought a number of wars with, with Syria over the decades. All those wars went pretty badly from, from Damascus's point of view. Israel has nuclear weapons. It's got the region's strongest, region's strongest military, so they're not well matched. And so in the 1980s, the Syrians decide to try to counter that by creating a, an arsenal of very powerful chemical weapons. These include extremely deadly nerve agents like sarin, the military grade uh, nerve agent that's 26 times deadlier than cyanide. And they also built delivery systems that can send chemical weapons into Israel and missiles and bombs in the case of a future war. So Syria spends a lot of money in the 80s building a network of secret labs to make these chemical weapons. And they put some of their best and brightest minds to work to make this happen. Now the aerial photo on the right shows an overhead view of, of the main lab, this military lab. It's located on a hilltop outside Damascus, and it's a top secret facility, and that's our setting. Now, in this lab, this is a portion of it that was built in the 80s, we meet a most unusual scientist. His name is Eamon, and as a young man, he attained a scholarship to attend school in the United States. He comes over here, he falls in love with America, he loves our people and our culture, and then he goes back home to Syria and first becomes a weapons scientist and then a top researcher in this secret program to make lethal agents like Saren. He's a bit quirky. He's a guy who decided to get married two women at the same time, which you can legally do in Syria, which is a Muslim country, but it's very unusual for professionals like him. And he talks about his odd family configuration with a visiting American in the snippet from the book. This is the first time we meet Eamon in Red Line. He seemed compelled to justify his living arrangements as another man might explain an extravagant impulse purchase. His first wife had been an excellent cook, he said, but he decided to marry the second considerably younger woman, his secretary, out of a purely carnal attraction. Who could have foreseen such turmoil? The two women squabbled constantly. 
except for times when they united to direct their scorn at him. He had wanted a spicier love life and ended up with a case of perpetual heartburn. I don't recommend it, he said to his friend. Now, by the time the story opens in 1988, Eamon has helped Syria develop a world-class weapon system with top-of-the-line equipment for making the full array of, of nerve agents for warfare. But Eamon, as it turns out, wore another hat. He was a spy for the CIA. He was recruited by the Americans in the late 1980s, and he passed secret information to the CIA for more than a decade. And one day, as recounted in the book, he even decided to give the CIA a sample of his wares a vial containing deadly sarin that the CIA could take home and analyze. This transfer is described as taking place in the front seat of a car. And it goes like this. After a brief exchange of pleasantries, the scientist produced a small package. It's nearly Christmas. You're a Christian, the chemist said, handing over the bundle. Here's a Christmas present. A few minutes later, the American was left alone to ponder what was inside the parcel's plain wrapping. What was inside was the good stuff high quality sarin, as the CIA found out, but just a few grams. At that same time, Syria was making these poisons by the ton. And by passing secrets to the CIA, Eamon was alerting the Americans to what his government was doing, while also becoming very rich. As the story unfolds, Eamon is betrayed. He trips up. And how and why that happens, I won't spoil the ending, but let's just say the story takes a dramatic twist in a way that seals Eamon's fate. But because of Amon, years later, when a brutal civil war erupts in Syria, the Americans understand very well the nature of this hidden danger that exists in Syria. The information from the spy makes clear that this conflict, Syrian uprising, is different from all the other uprisings we're seeing in Arab Spring. And underground bunkers like the one you see here, scattered throughout Syria, is enough sarin to fill several swimming pools. And now this country is being literally ripped apart by civil war. The government is losing control of the countryside. Military bases are being overrun. Some truly bad actors are moving into the conflict, including an Al-Qaeda offshoot known as al-Nusra and the Islamic State, ISIS. As the country unravels, these weapons are becoming a grave threat, not just to Syrians, but the entire world. It doesn't take much imagination to, imag to envision how even a gallon or two of sarin stolen from one of these bunkers and hauled out of Syria in a truck or a plane or a ship could become the ingredient for a horrific terrorist attack in a sports stadium or, stadium or uh, a subway station in London or New York or Washington. One attack could create massive numbers of casualties, and it would almost certainly increase pressure on the United States and other countries to intervene in serious civil war. Now, clearly, this is a disaster in the making. And so in 2012, some frantic conversations get underway in the Pentagon, at the White House, in capitals around the world, from the Middle East to Europe. And it's in this context of this fretting about this looming disaster that we meet this man. This is an Army chemical weapons expert named Tim Blades. He's one of the main characters in the book. Tim is colorful, shall we say. He's gruff, he's profane, he's cantankerous. He has literal physical scars from accidental exposures to chemical weapons in his youth. But he's kind of the Ray Donovan of the chemical weapons business. If chemical weapons are discovered in the United States or leftover stockpiles in Iraq or any place else in the world, Tim and his team are the ones that can swoop in and figure out how to make the stuff disappear. Now, in late 2012, Pentagon officials are struggling with what to do with, about serious chemical weapons, and they decide to meet with Tim. If somehow the Americans could get their hands on these chemicals, how can they get rid of them? But that's a big if. Nobody else, nobody has any idea how this might happen. The Pentagon makes some rough calculations about what it would take to secure all those chemical weapons facilities in Syria. And the estimate comes back and says, you'll need 70,000 troops, 70,000 Americans just to secure those facilities and to make sure they, they're kept safe. And then that's in addition to what it would take to steamroll their way back out of Syria with, with all this stuff and then seize, you know, protect all these facilities as the materials being extracted with a war going on around them. But even if that were all to happen somehow, even if they could get the stuff out, what do they do with it? What can they do with all these poison liquids and gases? Well, Tim thinks it over. He says, I have an idea. He huddles with his team in Edgewood, Maryland, and a few weeks later, they have a blueprint for a prototype. It's a portable machine that can fit inside two tractor trailers and can be set up anywhere in the world. 
the machine neutralizes sarin irreversibly, and the construction costs are less than it takes to build a single army tank. Tim builds his contraption, some will call it the margarita machine. They test it, it works. The Pentagon decides to order seven of them. They get built and they all go into a warehouse and no one thinks they'll ever actually be used. Tim complains about this to his wife one day. We spent a lot of money to build seven of these things, he said, recalling his words to Karen Blades years afterward, and we're never going to use them. Then bam, was I ever wrong. As Tim is working, something weird is happening inside Syria. There are reports of chemical weapons attacks in the countryside, but they're small and mysterious. And the evidence is murky. Sometimes just a single person is killed or a small handful. It's as though the Syrians are experimenting, trying to figure out whether it's feasible to use these weapons on a small scale in order to shift the tide of battle against the rebels. There's an international cry, there's a demand for investigations, and the UN starts to put together a team to look into these allegations but surprise, the Syrians aren't cooperating. They're not giving the UN access. And yet inside Syria, we see a few doctors and other professionals are starting to do their own fact finding. And in the book, we see one of these doctors, a young medical intern named Hussam al-Nahas. And when the war starts, he's just completed medical school and he's in his final year of his internship. His city, which is Aleppo in, in northern, northern Syria, is a hotbed of, of opposition, and the government is cracking down with brutal force against the rebels and their supporters, including doctors and nurses who treat them. One day in 2012, three of Husum's friends are caught carrying medical supplies, and they're arrested, tortured, killed, and then their burned bodies are dumped at the entrance of the hospital with their medical ID cards neatly placed on top of each corpse. Husum is horrified and outraged and becomes an activist for the opposition on this day. He does it first discreetly and later openly as a medical worker in a hospital in an opposition controlled part of Aleppo. He falls in love with a beautiful pharmacy worker and the two vow together that they'll either live together or if necessary, die together. And when their hospital becomes attacked by bombs or helicopters, they seek each other out and find a hospital bed to hide under to wait out the bombing. Meanwhile, Husam becomes obsessively concerned about these reports that the government is beginning to use its chemical weapons in attacks against the opposition, killing civilians mainly. He becomes a powerful advocate within the medical, medical community in northern Syria, urging preparation for dealing with victims exposed to nerve agents. He becomes so passionate, he earns a nickname, Chemical Hazm, Hazm being a name that in Arabic that means stubborn or strong-willed. But he did more than advocate. As the war progresses, and as the Assad regime shifts from traditional chemical weapons, such as ordinary industrial chemicals like chlorine, he chooses to put his life at risk to find evidence of the crime. With his friends, he crosses battle lines, braving helicopters and snipers to find the bits of evidence that would prove to the world that chemical weapons attacks were going on. Here's a scene from the book about one of those missions in a town called Kafir Zita, which is pictured here as it's being attacked by a chlorine bomb. The first to die had been the birds, the chickens and the pigeons in their roosts, and also wild swallows and sparrows that were caught in the path of the poison cloud and fell to the ground in clumps of two or three. Next came the smaller mammals, the goats, the sheep, sheep, the feral cats. These lasted perhaps a few minutes. One family's cow lingered for eight hours, wheezing pitifully as it slowly drowned from the buildup of fluid in her lungs. Some took photos of the animals and of the ugly red gouge in the earth where a barrel bomb had landed just behind a farmer's house. He took a deep breath. The faint odor of bleach was still detectable a day after the attack. The owner of the house, a farmer, had been home that morning caring for his invalid wife and several grandchildren. They heard a passing helicopter followed by a whistling sound like that of a falling bomb. But instead of an explosion, there had only been this loud jarring thud. The farmer tried to calm everybody, saying the bomb was, had missed them. Then came an overpowering chemical smell, and the grandchildren began to cough and choke. In a panic, the man rushed them into a bathroom, closed the door, and turned on the shower, forcing each child to stand under the water in hopes that this would somehow dilute the effects of the poison they were breathing. Having accomplished that, he ran to help his wife, who was too frail to move on her own. Later, Hussam learned, the woman died. Some followed the trail of the poison bloom to a culvert in a nearby olive grove where families sometimes sought shelter during air raids. The poison had settled in this low spot and two young children who had been hiding there with their families became gravely ill from the fumes and both later died. 
In each of the stricken towns, Husum and his friends easily found remnants of the bombs themselves. Using the, the specimen kits they brought from Turf Turkey, they, they recorded the exact locations with GPS equipment and scooped up metal fragments and a few tablespoons of soil, placing each sample in a plastic bag inside an ice chest. The steel tanks that held the poison were ripped open, but mostly intact and still visible. On the outside were three characters engraved in the metal casing. CL2 is the chemical symbol for chlorine gas. Husum found his evidence. And braving government controls and helicopters, he smuggled it across the border to alert the outside world. And the world starts to pay attention. As I mentioned, the United Nations had assembled a team of investigators, and some of the evidence finds its way to these experts. Amid growing international pressure, Syria finally relents and decides to let these UN inspectors into the country under very restrictive conditions. And this is the leader of that expedition. Oki Selström is a Swedish medical professor and a veteran of weapons inspection teams in Iraq years earlier. He's tapped by the UN for what seems to be a dead end mission to seek evidence of, a, of chemical weapons use in a country that doesn't even acknowledge having chemical weapons. He arrives in Damascus on August, in August of 2013 to press for answers and he's completely stonewalled. We have no chemical weapons, the Syrians tell him again and again. And yet, while Selstrom is still in Damascus, something extraordinary happens. On what the team believed to be the last night for the team in the country, there's a horrific new attack on the outskirts of the capital. The UN inspectors actually witness the attack as it's underway. Artillery rockets are being launched from the northern hills, and they arc over central Damascus where they're staying, hitting targets to the east and the south. When dawn breaks, it's clear that this was no ordinary attack. More than 1,000 people are killed by poison gas many of them small children still in their pajamas. Selstrom's immediate impulse is to go to the crime scene and collect evidence. This is the reason he had come to Syria in the first place. And eventually, after several days of, of arguing and, and UN pressure, he wins permission to, to leave Damascus to go to the rebel towns where the attacks took place. But there's a hitch. He has to go unarmed, on his own, no military escorts, no security. There's a fateful moment early in the expedition when the UN team's convoy is preparing to cross into no man's land. All of a sudden, the lead vehicle comes under attack. Bullets smack against the car's frame, the tires, the passenger windows, the windshield. The glass is shatter resistant and designed to hold up against small arms fire, but only to a degree. Now it's starting to crack and widen. The UN convoy quickly turns around and heads back to a military outpost. The narrative picks up at a point where Selstrom and two of his advisors are trying to decide what to do next. Mohammed Kafaji was the most familiar with the local terrain, so Selstrom turned to him with his most pressing question. What do we do, Mohammed, he asked. Kafaji didn't hesitate. We go in again, he said. What? Selstrom was incredulous. If we don't go today, we'll never go, Kafaji said. They'll know that they can scare us and your mission will be over. Selstrom sat quietly thinking. He was being asked to send his team back down a road where a waiting sniper was merely the only threat of which they were absolutely certain. Okay, he said after a minute, we go in again. Moments later, the Toyotas line up for a fresh attempt to cross into rebel territory. This one would look markedly different. Rather than cautiously feeling their way through no man's land, they would dash across it like inmates on a prison break. Kafaji grabbed a spare armored jacket and scooting into his seat, used his feet to press it up against the windshield. Team members in other cars did the same. And when everyone was ready, the SUVs passed to the checkpoint and then tore down the narrow road with as much speed as the drivers could muster. The vehicles shot across the bridge and did not slow down until all four were on the other side. This time, no shots were fired. Sostrom presses on with his mission and eventually succeeds. Evidence is found and collected, proving conclusively that sarin was used and that it came from the Syrian side. The OPCW, which is the chemical weapons watchdog, that sponsors the trip wins a Nobel Peace Prize for this mission. Everybody expects the United States will punish Syria with a missile strike any day, but that, that doesn't happen. Instead, a deal is struck between Russia and the United States. Now, how that agreement happens is a very complicated tale, which I get into in the book. And in any case, the agreement calls on Syria and the international community to do something that had never been attempted, and it's, which sounds pretty much impossible. There will be no missile strike, if Syria will submit to the removal and destruction of its entire chemical arsenal, its main strategic weapon system, in nine months in the middle of a civil war. 
In the book, we meet a second international team that's put together quickly to oversee this mammoth task, to oversee the physical elimination of the weapons and getting them out of the country. The team is headed by this remarkable Dutch diplomat, Sigrid Kog. Here she is. She's a mother of four. She's a UN official who has no military experience, no familiarity with chemical weapons, but she knows the region, speaks great Arabic. She's a good manager. And most importantly, she has the mental toughness to go head to head with the leaders of Syria's notoriously brutal and one must say very much male dominated regime. And she quickly discovers that no one really thinks Syria will ever give up its weapons. And this is just a useless exercise. And in fact, many countries would prefer to see the deal collapse and then they could do what they wanna do. The fact is, Cog would later say, almost no one connected to this mission really wanted it to succeed. We meet Sigrid in Syria in a particularly bleak moment in 2013. The book describes the predicament, the predicament that she and her, her fellow inspectors find themselves in. A freak autumn snowstorm had closed the mountain passes to the west for nearly a week, blocking needed supplies from coming into the country from Lebanon. Flatbed trucks that were arriving for transport duty were found to be missing steering wheels and other key parts. Procurement offices struggled to find adequate numbers of storage tanks, cranes, forklifts. Rebel armies, meanwhile, were on the move suddenly in the march and, and, and marching through the north and east, harassing military convoys and advancing within striking distance of the chemical weapons depots themselves. And the Syrians, pliant at first, suddenly began protesting and resisting everything. They balk about uh, security, they demand more armor, more heavy equipment, more time. And at this point, it's not yet clear how the chemicals would be physically removed and where they would go or how they would be self safeguarded around the, along the way. The OPCW's experts knew their job, but the agency didn't have the resources, the expertise, or even a good plan for eliminating 1,300 tons of deadly chemicals. Cog would later say, it was like bringing a patient to a non-existent hospital, or like trying to take a trip when there's no plane or no crew and no one who even knows how to fly. And yet these teams persist. They crisscross hundreds of miles of contested terrain, sometimes getting so close to the fighting they could hear the salvos from military duels or artillery duels whistling over their vehicles. Their hotel comes in under attack. They're targeted by Al-Qaeda, tra trailed by the Syrian secret police. And when progress with the Syrians begins to stall completely, they revert to the role of diplomats, haggling with the Russians, haggling with the Arab League, with the Iranians, anyone who could nudge the Syrians a step closer to their goal. Haganor deputies would drive across Damascus to see seek help from the only two countries that possessed enough clout to change Assad's behavior. She became a regular visitor at the Russian embassy and also at the Iranian embassy where the bearded ambassador would offer sympathetic ear and trays of roasted pistachios only to complain afterward that Cog's dress was too short or that she allowed too much of her blonde hair to spill out from underneath her head covering that she due to war. Exactly what those visits accomplished was never clear, but somehow eventually as a result of all this pressure, Syria announced that it was finally beginning to move some of its chemicals to the port of Latakia where they could be picked up. The change was so abrupt that COD's team had to rush to finalize arrangements for the pickup by volunteer ships from a half dozen countries that laid moored off the Syrian coast, waiting for the signal to come ashore. And sure enough, the chemicals are loaded up to be taken away for destruction. In the end, Syria's declared stockpile, what it admitted to, and turned out to be 90 to 95% of its overall chemical stockpile plus production equipment, is destroyed or hauled to a harbor to be taken out to sea. And yet when it's over, when the job is done, Cog can't bring herself to be happy about it. She looks around and sees that even though one particularly terrible weapon has been taken off the battlefield, Syrians are still getting killed every day from other weapons, from bullets and artillery shells and barrel bombs. And on top of that, Assad has started quietly using chemical weapons again, not the really bad stuff, the nerve agents that he had just hauled out of the country, but a kind of poor man substitute, chlorine. Chlorine is an industrial chemical you use to purify drinking water or you put in your swimming pool. It's not illegal to have it. It's not very powerful. It doesn't kill a lot of people, but it's a terror weapon. And so Syrians start using chlorine to terrorize people. And at the end, we see Sigrid and her colleagues feeling very mixed about what they've managed to achieve. I hope the people of Syria can forgive us, she tells a friend. We didn't change their lives. Getting the weapons out of Syria is only half the struggle. What do you do next? Who will take the weapons and neutralize them? The answer is 
No one, literally no one in the world. Now the Pentagon had its margarita machines, but it had no place to put them. What country was going to open a seaport to a toxic cargo like this one? So literally with no other options, the Pentagon decides that 10 blades margarita machines will be bolted onto the deck of an old cargo ship and blades would be placed in charge of what would become the world's first floating chemical weapons destruction factory operating in the middle of the Mediterranean. Now, this is not an optimal solution. This is not a great place to have thousands and thousands of gallons of the most dangerous li liquids ever invented. It's bad enough to do this on land. In the ocean, it's even worse. A ship at sea is constantly moving and flexing. The entire vessel pitches and rolls with a sea swell. Pipes and hoses get stretched and pulled. A big storm or rogue wave can overturn equipment or even the ship itself. Experts at the Pentagon call this idea harebrained. But in early 2014, the ship was the only option that remained. So Tim Blades and his Maryland crew, most of them professed land lovers, totally inexperienced at sea, climb aboard the motor vessel Cape Ray, load their margarita machines onto the decks, and prepare to attempt a feat that had never been tried literally in history. There are challenges, including some big ones. There's a major equipment malfunction. Then comes a leak. Parts wear out because of the corrosive nature of the chemicals. And as the work progresses, the ship becomes increasingly unstable because fuel is being burned off and fuel is ballast. And liquid waste from, from the process is being hauled up to the upper decks. So the ship becomes very top heavy and there are real concerns about the possibility that the boat's going to capsize. And meanwhile, news stories about this chemical weapon ship spinning circles around the Mediterranean sparks outrage across Southern Europe, and some of the opponents begin to organize. A flotilla of private vessels, protest ships, departs from Crete to hunt for the Cape Ray. And yet, somehow, despite all these challenges, it works. After 42 days, the last barrel of deadly chemicals is hauled up to the main deck, hooked up to the margarita machine and destroyed. No one is killed or injured. The fish in the Mediterranean live to survive or to feed another day. And yet the success is barely noticed by the rest of the world. And that's mostly because other crises were commanding our attention. One was the rise of the Islamic State, which captures Iraq's second largest city, Mosul, just as events in the Mediterranean are playing out. ISIS grabs the world's attention by beheading journalists and aid workers and all kinds of other things. And the United States and its allies go to war to stop them. If you read the book, there's a major storyline describing how ISIS, deprived of its chance to steal chemical weapons from Syria, decides to try to make its own chemical weapons. And you meet some really interesting characters in the book who are willing to help ISIS achieve this scary goal of becoming the first terrorist group with a production line for poison gas. I actually met with one of these lovely people, a former ISIS weapons engineer on death row in an Iraqi prison, and he fully admitted to what he did. And he said he was actually very happy with his time uh, in the Islamic State, living in the caliphate. And we find out that he was partly successful because ISIS succeeds in making some crude chemical weapons, like mustard gas, the, the thing that was used to, to great effect in World War I. Fortunately for us, they ran out of time. As coalition forces recapture Mosul, they destroy the Islamic State's laboratories and they kill and capture its scientists, although a few get away. Meanwhile, the war in Syria goes on and the success of the Cape Ray is overshadowed by the continuing and unrelenting human tragedy in Syria itself, including the refugees, the boat people, and then the chlorine attacks, which is a reminder of the fact that Syria had never really relented or changed its attention to use chemical weapons. And it would continue to use those and whatever it could to kill opposition members. There's never a moment of real accountability for Assad, who was never forced even once to acknowledge that he'd used chemical weapons a single time. Yet as bad as things are, it's important to remember the fact that it could have been worse for Syria and for the world if those 1,300 tons of chemical weapons had remained in the country. To this day, 10 years after the start of the Civil War, the deadliest single day in the entire 10-year conflict occurred on that morning in August 2013 when 1,400 people were killed in a sarin attack in the outskirts of Damascus. One attack, 1,400 deaths, and thousands of injuries. It's a reminder of how powerful these weapons are. On the last day of the Cape Ray's mission, the crew received 
a congratulatory email from one of the team's leaders that summed it up pretty well. And I'll close with this quote. Five months to create the first ever field deployable hydrolysis system, 66 days to outfit the vessel, 42 days to destroy hundreds of metric tons of serious, most dangerous chemical weapons at sea. The number we will never know, the number of men, women, and children in Syria who were saved but from death by chemical weapons. Thanks for coming along on my journey and for meeting a few of my favorite characters. I hope you were able to get a flavor and just a flavor of the kinds of challenges that were faced and overcome under excruciating circumstances to save the lives of people who had no idea and still don't that they were ever at risk. These are true heroes. And to me, I was honored to get to know many of them and to tell their stories. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I'd be happy to take questions if anyone has any about the book, about Syria, about Middle East, reporting and writing that went into this story or anything that's on your mind. Thanks again. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Panarea, hold on. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Thanks, Meg. Uh, an excellent uh, book sounds like because it was an excellent review that you gave. Thank but you. I do have one question or comment. Um, everybody really just came down so hard on uh, the second, sec, uh, who was it at that time? We were, Obama was going to have a military uh, flight over and, and destroy a lot of the stuff, yeah. mm -hmm. a lot of the people. And the only reason why, uh, because they uh, was the Secretary of State, I forgot his name. It was Clinton at the time as Secretary. So you're talking about the red line comment. Was, the red was, line comment, uh, yes. Okay. The red line comment. And no one has given any, uh, any acclaim to the Obama administration mm -hmm. for saving, taking all this uh, chemical weapons out of the picture. <laughs> yeah. And all he said was that he, he, he crumbled. And I have always thought that this was so very important and everybody has turned it around to be a defect and yeah. i don't think i know life is not fair yeah but, and uh, yeah that's a very good question and and i i think i can i can address that the book does to quite a degree as well and you're right i mean this was not an easy decision i mean the the, the reason that obama had made the red line comment in the first place and this becomes clear in the book is because at the time he made it there was a pretty scary intelligence that really has not been shared publicly. It's in the book, but it hasn't been talked about publicly. The Syrians were preparing to give some of these chemical weapons away. And they're preparing to give them, the Israelis believe, based on their intelligence, to Hezbollah, which is a, a militant group. We consider them terrorist organization next door in Lebanon because the Syrian regime felt that it might lose them. So let's give them to someone why not give it to Hezbollah next door? And for you could imagine the reaction in, in, in Israel to that. They were already giving out gas masks to their citizens in northern towns and villages, worried about the possibility of a blowover from a chemical attack. If you can imagine Hezbollah with tens of thousands of rockets pointed toward Israel, getting sarin to put in those rockets, it would be a complete game changer for the Middle East. And so you see Clinton and, and, and Obama both getting up and telling Syria, don't do this. If it's going to be a huge mistake, if you do, they were saying it publicly. They went uh, diplomatic channels. They talked to the Russians, the Iranians, said to everyone saying, don't do this. Uh, and at one point, it was a press conference. It was kind of an unscripted moment. Obama used the word red line, essentially repeating the same message he, he'd used before, warning the Syrians to, to back off. And they, actually, they did back off. So you, the movement that we saw, the, the thing that we were worried about, they stopped doing. But then years, you know, a year later, fast forward uh, to, to uh, August of 2013, this red line comment is being used to, or, you know, was as uh, kind of boxing Obama in. Uh, he felt that pressure, or certainly his political enemies and adversaries were, were saying, well, you know, you've promised that this is a red line, whatever red line means. If chemical weapons are used, you're going to respond. Uh, mm -hmm. But he did respond. And his response was, Remarkably, you know, getting rid of a, a major stockpile, which was a huge international concern. Uh, and if you want to compare administration's approaches, we see 
Uh, you know, years later, Trump uses a, a missile strike to respond to a chemical weapons attack in 2017 and talks, well, I, I enforced the red line, but it accomplished nothing. It, it, yeah. it shut down a runway for one day and destroyed a couple of airplanes and, and uh, Assad started using chemical weapons again. So it didn't, didn't eliminate a stockpile. It didn't eliminate a threat. It made us feel better for a few days, but it really achieved no purpose. So strategically, if you look back, I would argue, and you can see, you know, you can draw this conclusion from the book and you read it, that the, you know, the removal of the, of the weapons, as imperfect as it was, accomplished a real good. Because you can't. I, I, you, I, yeah. I agree with you. And the thing is that they did not uh, fill it out on the press enough. They yeah. did not say what they had done and why they had done it. It yeah. was too quiet. And, so and you're right about that, too. Yeah. And in the book, it's there's a, a decision actually to not sort of brag about it when it when it was finished because the situation in Syria was so bad that the optic of going out and saying look what we did we did a great thing it it just felt like it was it was it wouldn't be the right moment to do that and so they they pretty much sat on it they talked about it a little bit but they didn't they didn't really boast about what they'd accomplished and and that's one of the reasons to me when I when I got onto the subject and realized how close we were to real disaster with those chemical weapons and the fact that they were mostly taken out of the country, that was an extraordinary accomplishment and, and one that you're right, has not been fully recognized. And I hope that people who read the book will come away with an appreciation for what that decision actually did accomplish. As, as flawed, and I'll, I'll acknowledge that, there were difficulties and problems with it, um, but, but it was a true good that was achieved by getting rid of them. Yes, I agree, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Okay, Zach has his hand up. Yeah. Hi. I I wanted this is more like a, a commendation rather than a question. Um, that, when I was still working uh, at the State Department, I'm a career foreign service officer and then later a contractor. I was working in the Nonproliferation and Disarmament Fund, uh -huh. and um, we tried to uh, get in uh, to an agreement with then uh, uh, Libyan leader Gaddafi to get rid of his mustard gas. Uh, he had a, a large, relatively large stockpile of it, and we went a fairly large, a long way down uh, the contracting road. Yeah. Eventually, having an agreement with Gaddafi to uh, incinerate his mustard gas in country. Uh, regrettably, they reneged, uh, and um, well, that that's a different story. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the the effort that we were going to put together on the ground would have been horrendously expensive, very technically challenging, and would have been a security nightmare. Yeah. Uh, and that was just for mustard gas, a World War I uh, level uh, chemical weapon. So what uh, these folks did in removing a, a tremendously larger quantity of much more dangerous uh, and destabilizing sarin uh, really is the story that deserves to be told. And I want, uh, firstly, I wanted to commend you for telling it. Um, I also wanted to echo uh, the, the previous questioner's comment that uh, it's a, a story that Frankly, we, we ought to be patting ourselves on the back for. There are precious few examples uh, in uh, post-World War II uh, diplomatic history uh, yeah. of being able to uh, remove a large stockpile of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, this would be one of the very, very few. Uh, yeah. There are literally, if there's a handful of such examples, uh, it would be a lot. I can only think of two. Uh, one in which my uh, office was involved in uh, at an earlier stage before I joined and um, later the, the divestment of nuclear weapons by the South Africans. Mm. But um, uh, I, I simply wanted to commend you for your effort. And uh, I really do think the Obama administration uh, let itself get uh, tarred with a bad brush uh, in, in the red line incident and uh, really, really ought to have tooted its own horn more effectively. Yeah. And you're right. I have to thank you, Zach. And, and just, wow, how great to have your perspective on this. Um, and you're right, for, for re, um, listeners who aren't aware of this, there was a kind of a parallel situation in, in Libya, which it was a much smaller quantity, much less serious, uh, what, you know, uh, weapon. Uh, and we ended up, you know, having to take care of some of that after Gaddafi fell. But again, the situation in Syria was much more perilous and the country was in the middle of a civil war. So what was, there's so many remarkable things about it. And one was this, this rare moment where, the international community and its institutions worked 
because you know the UN, as we know, is not well is not known for quickly responding to to crises. It usually takes a while to spin up. There's all kinds of fights and debates. This is a moment where things came together in days, literally, and inspectors are on the ground two weeks after the after the Security Council resolution was passed, starting to work on the job. And it was this sort of this last great hurrah of of multilateralism before we you know went to uh, you know America first and you know and and, and is what what followed that and, and kind of everybody every man for himself or every country for himself. So yeah, I mean the, the fact that this happened and it happened in the middle of a war and it happened so quickly, um, it's it's just it's you know it just you just smack your head thinking about it how how un, how amazing it is that that we were able to pull this off without some great catastrophe and of course something had gone wrong if the ship had capsized or or something bad had happened this is all we'd be talking about but it didn't and this was in a way it was the crisis that didn't happen and um and i just think it's remarkable thank you for that zach i really appreciate the comment okay real quick i'm going to combine two couple questions actually what evidence do we have that we got all the chemical weapons out of syria and what is the status of the chemical weapons in syria today Okay, good questions. So we yeah, we didn't get them all, and we kind of knew that at the time. I mean, the CIA, for one, and other intelligence agencies were were actually telling the UN teams there's probably more stuff out there that we need to to be looking for. Um, but it was so the UN team comes with a mandate, which is to we have this declared stockpile, thirteen hundred tons of bad stuff we're going to get rid of, and and that's our job. We're not going to be running around the country looking for things. It's not our job. So so they kind of took out the stuff they they knew about, and that that's when the mission ended. The CIA's estimate is somewhere between ninety to ninety five percent of the weapons removed, and that's a lot. Um, the bigger deal, actually, to me, is the fact that not only did they got rid got rid of the stuff. They got rid of the production equipment. So these those big uh, underground facilities that you saw in the slides, um, <laughs> the efforts, you know, the product of years and years of work and millions of dollars of investment, those were systematically dismantled and smashed into pieces, and the tunnels were blown up. So Syria can never use those again. And as far as we know, they've never made nerve agents again. They do probably have a residual amount of, you know, in the mountains someplace. Um, they used it. They used uh, actually some chemical weapons, uh, you know, not just chlorine, but some sarin in 2017. And, and it, we believe in 2018, we're not, not quite sure about the second incident, proving that they had it. And investigations, forensic testing showed it was the same stuff they had before. And, and that's not really a surprise. But from a proliferation point of view and from a the, sort of as a threat to all of us, the fact that there's a little bit left somewhere in Syria, probably heavily guarded, is not nearly the crisis that it might have been when there was, you know, swimming pools full of this stuff scattered around the country in places where really bad guys could have gotten it. So, so there is material there. Um, the, the current status is is that um, a little bit left over. The Syrians seem to be leery of using it. They've used chemical. They've used chlorine a few times in the last two years, but the bad stuff, whatever they've got left, they have it. Uh, been brave enough to show that they still have it because they know it would invite all kinds of, of reaction. But it's just a risk that we continue to live with. And there's always a possibility that if you know the war erupts again in the Idlib area where there's still, you know, rebels still hold a good chunk of territory, if the Syrians use chemical weapons, again, the, the Biden administration is going to have a tough decision to make. Okay, Rayla, please ask your question. Uh, this is this is Russell. Um, thank you for your presentation. You mentioned uh, uh, briefly the long-standing animosity between Syria and Israel, and clearly these chemical uh, weapons. Uh, the the threat to uh, Israel is second only to the threat to the uh, Syrian people themselves. So the question is: uh, Were Israelis in any way involved, or and or were they kept aware of this operation that you've described? Mm. I could tell you that the diplomacy <laughs> um, between the, the Israelis and the Americans or just, just the level of engagement throughout this whole process was, was at a very high level. Uh, if you read the book, you'll see that the Israelis um, really seized on this idea when it first came up of a possible, a possibly disarming Syria or taking, taking care of the chemical weapons 
uh, stockpile. And you can imagine there are good reasons for wanting to see it happen. But they were talking, sending through to, to back channels, sending messages to, to Obama administration people saying that this was a great idea that we could get a on board with this. And we've been talking to the Russians as well. We think the Russians could get the Syrians to come around. So they were absolutely uh, thrilled about this result. Uh, and they remain leery. Um, you see these occasional military strikes, so unilateral airstrikes by the Israelis, um, mostly targeting Iranian um, weapon systems that are coming into Syria that are worrisome, you know, missiles and, and, and so on. But there've been a couple of incidents where it's been reported, I think reliably, that the, the Israelis thought they had the location of a residual stockpile of chemical weapons, they decided to go after those two because they still worry about it. Even as a perhaps the Syrians aren't going to put them in a in a Scud missile and launch them toward Tel Aviv, but they could be used in a in a, in a you know a terrorist attack, and so they're they're still very concerned about that. And this is again, this is there's no country that's had that's faced a bigger threat uh, from this weapon system than the Israelis themselves. Okay, um, I have a question for, in the question and answer. Does Syria and Assad have any sanctions applied to them from Western governments or the UN for his chemical attacks? Yeah, this is part of the frustration of this whole story. And it's, it's, it's described to some degree in the book as well, that this inability of Western institutions, despite the fact they perform so well in getting this stuff out, their inability to to hold Assad to account, to you know, there's been so much documentation of these attacks, and anybody who denies or tries to argue that Assad wasn't responsible just really doesn't know what they're talking about. has hasn't looked at the evidence, but there the there's been this inability by the UN in particular because of Russia's veto. To, to bring meaningful sanctions against the Syrian regime. The United States has had its own, there's the Europeans, all these other countries have certainly brought all kinds of economic sanctions against Israel or against Syria rather. And it's had an effect, it's, it's, it's hampered their ability to get um, oil, to get weapons delivered, all kinds of, of things. But the Russians and the Iranians have, have seen to it that, uh, that Syria has whatever it needs to survive. Um, and we've seen that from the very beginning, but especially starting from 2015 onward, the Russians were willing to commit military resources to their own personnel and aircraft and, and troops on the ground. And the Iranians and their allies have, have certainly done that from the very beginning, committing thousands and thousands of fighters uh, you know, to make sure that Assad survives and also to make sure that his, his economy survives. And it's been a hugely expensive endeavor for both Russia and and Iran, but it, and for those two countries, their survival of Assad is a national security interest. We'd like to see him go. We hate the guy. We think he's terrible. He's he's a he's a he's a war criminal. Uh, but for them, it's a it's a truly a national security issue. For the Russians, they believe that uh, you know this is their best ally in the Middle East. They have the only warm water port in the world. For the Russians, is in on the coast of Syria in the town of Tartus. Uh, the Iranians uh, see Syria as their main Arab ally and, and part of a, this this essentially uh, land bridge they have from that goes from Iran across northern Iraq to Syria to Lebanon to where their their main um, Hezbollah ally is. So they they desperately want Assad to remain in power, and they were willing to commit whatever resources were needed to make sure that he survived and also to protect him from any kind of serious sanction at the UN. Okay, Audrey, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Well, I had a comment to make. When you were talking about the various heroes and all the and the cooperation among different countries and different people to accomplish this marvelous uh, event, there were two people that come to mind. And I guess foremost was this man, and I think he may have had Muhammad in his name, but I think he was a local person who said when the UN security force was going in to observe what had happened, he said, we go back in today. And then secondly, the American who agreed to do it. I think that was just remarkable and heroic. Yeah, I, I could not agree with you more. And I've gotten to meet all these people. The wonderful thing about you know, writing a book like this, and you know, normally, as you can imagine, you know, the, the job of a journalist on a daily basis is it's pretty hectic, and and you don't get the time to to spend 
sort of do the kind of deep research you can do with a book. So I had book leave. I was able to travel and, and, and to meet all these people. And they are remarkable. And they're not, you know, and, and as I said in the beginning, you don't necessarily sort of our conventional wisdom is you don't see this kind of heroics in, in big bureaucracies. And you don't see them in, in big international organizations like the UN. But they are there. And they, they don't do this for a lot of money or for much glory. But they literally put their lives on the line. And you can imagine these, these, these group of volunteers from probably, I think, 15 countries represented this small team, some WHO doctors who came along and, and the rest of them were weapons inspectors or security guys who were just there without weapons, without guns to help make sure that nobody got in trouble. And they faced a, a real death threat. They had just gone down this road and they gotten shot at. You saw the pictures. I've got a ton more. There was another situation just a few, you know, a few hours later when they had arrived at, at the place where their investigation began. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes this big truck with this cannon, you know, essentially a, a big, uh, you know, uh, rocket launcher, pointed it right at, at, the, at the first vehicle in the convoy and was about to blast it into pieces. And no armor, you know, no, no vehicle armor was going to protect it. And just, just by the bravery of Syrians on the ground, you talk the guy out of shooting uh, but that's the kind of stuff they faced. And, and every day when they went out, they weren't sure they were going to come out, come back again. And, and dude, these local guys and, the, and so the this international team, uh, just as courageous um, and, and just as, as well-intentioned as you could possibly want. And just, just have to be thankful they're all on our team. And, and, um, and they were there to make sure that uh, the job got done. And it's just truly it's some of the most amazing, amazing people I've ever met. Can you tell us again what the man's, the two men's names were? So, yeah. So the first one is someone that shows up briefly in the book. His name is Mohammed Kafaji, K-H-A-F-F-A-G-I. I think I've got that right. He's an Egyptian national, actually. He was part of the, the UN um, cadre in, in Syria. So when the, the war breaks out, when the uprising starts, you know, the, the UN has its own relief agencies there anyway, and they have security advisors, guys who are familiar with how to, you know, make sure that uh, perimeters are secure and make sure that nobody gets hurt. He was the local guy. He was the one who'd been living in Syria for years and understood all the actors on the ground and had made all the arrangements for this trip to take place to, to investigate uh, problems in this village that had been attacked. And it was essentially, he was the one at the decision point who, who, who had to make the decision, do we go or not? And he said, let's go. And the other is, is this guy, Selstrom, is uh, someone actually, have, he's become a friend since the book came out. He's a, he's a big fan and, um, uh, of the book and, um, and is just delighted that the story is told. And he's a guy, the complication with him, and you'll see this is just a really remarkable thing about his personality. He's a devoted pacifist. And he actually was exempted, was exempted from um, military service in, in his native uh, Sweden because he didn't believe in war. And so here's a guy who's going into this situation to confirm the use of a chemical weapon, to essentially confirm a war crime. And if he finds it, if he finds the evidence, he knows there might be a war as a result of his, his findings. And so you see him wrestle with that throughout the entire story. He wants to do the right thing. He decides just to stick with the science and go where the science tells him to go, knowing all along that the consequences could be, you know, something completely out of his control and, and, and might be bad for some civilians. So he's, he's a very remarkable and very complicated character. I hope you enjoy him if you could take a chance to read the book. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you, Audrey. Nice chatting with you. I have a question from the Q&A. Would bombing these chemical plants and stockpiles release the chemicals into the countryside? And is that why people are reluctant to bomb the places they think there are still chemicals? Exactly. That's a very good question. And we get into that in some detail in the book, too. But this is the other thing when this sort of the red line argument gets made and people sort of attack uh, the decision not to bomb. The thing is, what do you bomb? You don't bomb the, the stockpiles themselves. If you want to get rid of the chemical weapons, you don't do it by dropping a bomb on them. Because if you do, you're probably going to release uh, more chemicals and you're going to kill more people than you, than you, than, than you ever would have killed in, in, in another operation. And you, you, you see the, the, the Pentagon of people literally wrestling with this as, as the story unfolds. Because some of the generals are saying, well, why don't we just bomb these places? Why don't we just take them out? And, and some of the experts, the guys who really know the subject and are, they're pushing back and saying, you can't, you can't put missiles on these things. It's going to be a disaster. And so this back and forth thing takes place. 
And, you know, in the end, it, it just becomes clear that if, well, we're not going to decapitate the regime. We're, we're, we're not going to invest ourselves in, in, in that kind of military strike. We're trying to remove the dictator. We're, we can't take out the chemical weapons. So the only thing you could do with a military strike is essentially wrap uh, Assad on the knuckles. And, and that's, his most, that's the most you're going to accomplish. And the Syrian rebels, and, and they, they were very upset, as, as you may know, that we didn't strike. But they were hoping that that this first military strike by Obama would lead to a much broader military campaign, and this would be the tipping point, and everything would change. And to, to be honest, as much as you feel for these people, that was not going to happen. The United States was not prepared to become militarily involved in Syria in, in a major way. It just was not in the cards, neither by Republicans or Democrats. There was just no appetite after you know, nearly 20 years of fighting in the Middle East. Nobody wanted to get back, sucked back into a, a fight in Syria, and especially in Syria, a place as dangerous and complicated where you really never know who the good guy is and who the bad guy is because there's some really bad guys on both sides. Thanks for the question. Joel, can you unmute and ask your question? Yes, thank you for a terrific presentation. Thank you. From what you know, how, what lessons were learned in the, in the uh, US government bureaucracy in terms of being better prepared for a next, a next use of chemical weapons? Mm. You know, that's a, that's a good question because as always in this situation, we were, you know, we were kind of fixated on the last war, the last battle. And the, in, in this arena, the last battles had been getting bad stuff out of the former Soviet states, um, you know, arms control agreements for the Russians, uh, disarmament deals to the Ukrainians to get rid of weapons they had with Kazakhstan, um, and also a, a very much a, a focus on weapons other than chemical weapons, which by, you know, the early 2000s were not regarded as that serious. I mean, it was, they were not, a lot of people didn't even consider them a true weapon of mass destruction because um, they don't have nearly the killing power of nuclear weapons, obviously, and they don't, um, they can't spread in the way that biological weapons can. So it was sort of an afterthought. But now that's changed. And we've seen that, that um, there is this potential for these things to become very disruptive um, in a in a military conflict like the one in Syria, where it's essentially a civil war, but where there could be spillover, where, where stuff can get out and leak to other bad actors. And as the book unfolds, you see a very scary situation develops where ISIS gets the idea, and I said this in presentation, that it wants to make its own. And it, and it gets close. It starts to make bad stuff too. Uh, it, even after the fall of Mosul, even after the caliphate starts to collapse, they um, continue to plot chemical attacks and they try to pull off a, a big attack in, in Australia that nearly happens and they haven't given up on the idea. So for, for one thing, I guess uh, one thing we've learned is, is that this, this chemical weapons problem and threat is a significant one and it's one that is not going away and it's one that we have to prepare for, one we have to be educated about and to try to control precursors, to try to control the, you know, the development of technology, um, and just try to keep bad stuff from getting out of the hands of bad people. Thanks for the question, Joel. David asks in the Q&A, early in the war, there was pressure on Obama to provide weapons to the rebels. Do you think he should have? Hmm. So here's another thing that this, the, the book describes um, a very little known uh, covert program that, that happened um, during the Obama administration, which actually was a re re consequence of those early chemical weapons attacks. Because you know, Obama had, had issued the, the red line threat. Uh, it became clear before the big attack that there were small incidents that appeared to be chemical weapons attacks taking place. Uh, but rather than responding militarily directly, uh, he agreed finally to authorize the training and equipment uh, equipping of, of rebel forces. This began something that was called Operation T um, uh, Sycamore Timber. And it began in, in late uh, 2013, early 2014, uh, and became like a billion dollar program in which tens of thousands of rebels were brought across the border into Turkey, were given training, money, weapons, including some, some anti-tank weapons, and then sent back uh, in, into the South. And it was a complete disaster. It was a complete failure because what happened is that Rebels would cross the border and either be captured by other groups like, like Nusra or Al-Qaeda, 
or they would surrender their weapons to those groups and join the other side. Things just went missing. Um, they weren't able to, to, to hold together as a cohesive military force. So it didn't go very well for us. Um, so that's, you know, one experience. And the other was just, you know, the, the we were arming, you know, there was no shortage of, of weapons, I guess is what I'm trying to say, because we were encouraging, you know, or allowing the, the Saudis and other Gulf Arabs to just funnel incredible amounts of, of, of weapons into this into this conflict. And the effect essentially was was gasoline on a fire, that this is already this brutal grinding fight that nobody was going to win clearly. But it just got more and more deadly and more destructive because just the amount of weapons that were flowing in from all kinds of places. And during my reporting, I'd go up on the border in Turkey and, and there'd be hotels where you could see, you know, guys from the Gulf coming in with big suitcases full of cash to, to give uh, to their favorite rebel group. And there were hundreds of rebel groups, literally hundreds. So they're just incredibly fragmented to, uh, in some cases, the, the rebel group would, would rename itself after their benefactor. And so it would be the, the, the Sheikh uh, Arabi, you know, militia group, and they'd do videos and, and kind of show off the name and things like that. And thanks for the gift. And the gift would be, you know, an anti-tank weapon and, and, and a bunch of, of small arms. And so the, the, if we had if we had seriously wanted to change the outcome, it probably would have required a U.S. or NATO troop presence on the ground. Uh, no fly zone alone wouldn't have, wouldn't have turned the tide of battle, in my opinion. It would have required a direct U.S. military involvement because no amount of, of, of arming uh, was ultimately able to overcome the weapons and support coming from the Russian and the Iranian side. And we didn't want to take on the Russians and the Iranians in a war in Syria, so just we weren't going to match them gun for gun. So I, I feel like as, as sad as the situation is, um, there's almost no scenario in my mind that you can really see the Syrian rebel, the Syrian opposition prevailing in this fight, even if we had given them some stuff, if we weren't willing to come in ourselves with our troops and our planes. What incentives were used to get Assad to turn over his chemical weapons? Seems he had <laughs> a pretty strong hand with these weapons. Yes, he did. And he was not uh, at all interested in getting rid of them. Um, but what happens, and it's, it's kind of, it's, I'm laughing because some of the circumstances are funny. Essentially, what it took was the Russians basically telling them, you got to get rid of these. And the Russians, is, in my reporting, were not too happy about these chemical attacks either. They, they were able to tolerate the little ones. Um, you know, they didn't mind it too much. They're willing to, to kind of uh, support Assad and have his back. But in August 2013, when you suddenly have you know hundreds of people killed, mostly women and children, on international cable television networks, it was a big embarrassment for the Russians. They were embarrassed because this was their guy and he was committing these atrocities. And they were also worried about what he was going to do next. And so they essentially told Assad, look, <laughs> here's your choice. You got to get rid of the weapons or we're not going to back you anymore. And, and Assad turned around very quickly and decided, OK, I'll, I'll go with that. Uh, there's a funny anecdote that occurs later in the book where uh, John Kerry, Secretary of State, later on, is arguing with, with uh, Sergei Lavrov, the, the Russian foreign minister, about something else Syria was doing. And they're having a pretty heated fight, and it's over, overheard by some aides. And Kerry says to, to Lavrov in exasperation, look, you know, you know how to change the, uh, the, the Syrians' behavior. Back with the chemical weapons thing, you're able to turn them around in 24 hours. And Lavrov is just kind of it was slippery, you know, very slick guy, turns to, to Kerry and says, less, just to give you a sense of the, the power of the Russians to sort of motivate and change Syria's behavior when they really wanted to. It didn't take them 24 hours. They did it in a phone call, and that was the end of the program. Sorry about that. Um, Panarea, you can unmute and ask your question. It didn't have my hand up, but I do really want to thank you. It is an excellent presentation. Thank and you. this background of that it took the Russians less than an hour, 24 hours to make the Assyrians obey really shows excellent power. And um, and that is true power. Uh, the whole thing is fascinating. Uh, mm. I thank you for your research, which seems to be very, very intensive. And I do agree with you that the 
most uh, um, danger that we have are these uh, chemical weapons that are just floating around and people who want to use them because they have no respect for them and, and cybersecurity. So those, are, you know, I, I never used to worry about atomic bombs because I was born and raised in DC. I said, well, okay, if atomic bomb comes, I'll just die quickly. But these other things are, are, are worse mm -hmm. than uh, the atomic bombs. Thank you. Yeah, you're right about the fact it's it's sometimes not the, the scary weapon which becomes the one we have to worry about because the scariest ones, there are good reasons why nobody is, neither the Soviet Union or the United States uh, in, involved, were involved in, in a nuclear exchange and, and, and why no uh, nuclear weapons have been used since the Second World War because the, the prospect of retaliation and, and this sort of massive scale of destruction are such that 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 no one or you know, no one really wants to go down that road, and and there's still to this day, remarkably to me, only a limited number of, of countries that have even decided to join the nuclear club, including some ones that were concerned about, like the the North Koreans, uh, but uh, but a relatively small group of countries. Chemical weapons, though, is, is is it's it's different, and you can see what's been fascinating to me is to watch countries kind of nibble around the edges with chemical weapons. Just since the Syrian uh, conflict uh, began, you saw Russia twice now using a chemical weapon in what was essentially an assassination. Um, it, it went after a, uh, a you know a, a de defector who lived in England, tried to kill him and his daughter. They made him sick. They didn't end up killing him, but they killed two or killed a, a British woman. And then you saw them using it again against this opposition figure, Navalny. And the North Koreans, the same. Uh, Kim Jong-un decides to use no, uh, uh, the X, a really horrible chemical weapon, to kill his own stepbrother in an airport in Malaysia. Uh, both seem to be signaling to everyone that we have these weapons. We can use them if we want to in all kinds of insidious ways. It's not going to be necessarily a war weapon, but we have ways of, of, of making bad things happen. Um, the 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 attack in England in Salisbury, England, where this uh, this dissonant was attacked. Uh, the murder weapon was a vial of 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 Novichok, this really uh, sort of Russian-made, very dangerous chemical weapon. Very small perfume bottles. What they put the the, the weapon in. The the contents of that that if, if you could somehow evenly evenly just divide that up, there's enough poison there to kill thousands of people. And so that, again, that just shows you the power of this stuff. And, and VX and Novichoks are, have this sinister quality where you don't need to inhale it. You just need to get it on your skin and just, it goes to the skin and, and it kills people that way. Um, and just, um, you know, just, just a, a, a tiniest amount, just a little, uh, you know, just you know, for the guy in, in the, the airport in Malaysia, <laughs> a woman just smeared a little bit on, his, on this guy's face and he was dead within minutes. Um, so there are all kinds of things they can do with this uh, and it's potentially denial, you know, a, a kind of weapon that you could deny the responsibility for because, you know, it, it might take a long time to prove that you were behind it and maybe the evidence is inconclusive and you could just deny it anyway. So it gives you all kinds of potential ability to do bad things without triggering a larger conflict potentially. And cyber is the same way. It's just one of these weapons where you can inflict incredible damage and yet do it, you know, through proxies or do it without necessarily calling attention to yourself denying you had any role in it, so you don't necessarily have to face any consequences. This makes them very dangerous. Is Russia's major interest the port there? Don't they now have a port in Crimea? Crimea? Hmm. So there, so yeah, in the beginning, this was their only warm water port in the world, and that was important, but it wasn't just the port. It's also their it turns out it's a very important intelligence post for the for the for the Russians. Their international surveillance networks, a lot of the sort of the wiring of that goes through this this small naval facility they have there. And it's also kind of become becomes for Russia uh, and, and for Putin specifically as the war begins a point of personal pride for him. And in this this becomes for Russia their first significant um, military escapade, you know, outside their neighborhood. Um, you know, since Afghanistan, they, they're, they're sending troops into a, a, to a, a Middle Eastern country and aircraft and, and, and launching sorties, you know, for the first time in, in you know, outside the, the former Soviet states since, since the 80s. And they do it because 
the, Russia and Putin are able to show that Russia is is kind of the decider uh, of, of of events in this country. They are the they are the country that everybody in the region looks to for for solutions. The Israelis, the Jordanians, the Turks, everybody realizes that that Russia, not America, is is the big player in this this arena. And that's a big deal for for uh, for Putin. He can showcase his military wares. He can uh, he can uh, you know talk about his influence. He can become an irritant to the Americans and, and foil their plans. And so it's gone from being this well, we need to protect a, our little port here, to being this big sort of geopolitical um, symbol for Russia that they have to they have to project power here, and it's become very very important for them. So no matter what happens, and I think that. The Syrian conflict is is not anywhere close to being resolved, and we may still see some surprises. Um, they're not going to give up on this. They want to make sure that they control what happens in Syria, and they come out as winners one way or another. Okay, Lillian, can you unmute and ask your question? Hi, thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, you know, I'm not a scientist, but I'm wondering, is there a way to control uh, the uh, ingredients that make up these chemical weapons that uh, would help to deter these countries from producing them? Do you, do you know if it's even possible? Yeah, that is a very good question. And there are specific precursors for sarin in particular, and for all the sort of the whole family of nerve agents that are not that easy to get. And you see the Syrians in the 80s essentially buying all the stuff from, from our allies, not from the United States necessarily, but they bought from the British and from the Germans and from the Dutch, the Swiss, um, and, and bought their equipment as well because there's very specific kinds of metal alloys that you need to do the mixing because if you use uh, you know, steel or, or, or nickel or something else, it, it's this, these, these chemicals are so corrosive, they'll destroy the, the equipment. And so Syria outfitted itself by you know, shopping around the world. And, and these you know, companies were more than happy to sell their stuff and not ask questions. They didn't care necessarily where it went. So that has changed. And I'm happy to say that the world, uh, sort of the international community has gotten a little more sophisticated about tracking and controlling certain products that, that are signatures or, or, or essentially clues to a possible chemical weapons program. So we do that, um, but there are workarounds. And you see, for example, the Iranians have a pretty significant um, pharmaceutical industry. They make some of this stuff too. Some of the chemicals aren't that hard to get um, without giving too much away about sarin. They're essentially, if you have this thing called binary sarin, it's essentially like peanut butter and jelly. You have one chemical, which is kind of a concoction of various things. The other chemical is just isopropyl alcohol. That's the only, uh, that's the only thing you need to activate the other ingredients to make sarin. And of course you can buy that off the shelf at, at, at uh, you know, anywhere. And the, we've seen even since the, the, the nuclear or the chemical weapons deal in 2014, Syria has, has bought, you know, tons and tons of is isopropyl alcohol. We just have to assume that there are hope that's being used for legitimate uh, medical, you know, pharmaceutical purposes and not to make more weapons, but you just, you just can't guarantee it. The, uh, the policing though, and the, the tracking of this stuff to try to, to limit the, the spread of it as much as we can, it is something we can do and it is have an effect in terms of limiting the ability of, of certain bad actors from getting the stuff they need to make really bad stuff. Okay, one more question. What is the future for Syria? And tied on to that is, do you have an opinion on what we should do with the Palestinian Israeli uh, conflict? Oh man. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm definitely gonna, I, 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 I have such conflicted feelings as I watch the news the last um, few days. It's just horrific to watch and you just, I, I, my only comment about it is we, we should have seen it coming. I mean, there's, you know, there was this belief that the things had gotten better and, you know, we, you know these deals have been reached between Israel and, and some of the Gulf Arabs and, and it looked like maybe things were on a, on a positive trajectory, but none of it addressed the problems on the ground and, and the ground problems are the ones that that we've seen erupting here in the last last uh, few days. I spend a, a pre-pandemic a lot of time in the region and particularly in Jordan where you you know where many Palestinians live and um, 
and it's and also also in Israel and just just to hear the stories and and, and just see the tensions that are just ready to erupt. It's it's just been a remarkable experience. But for Syria, the only kind of ray of hope uh, for me when I think about that awful problem set is the fact that Syria is in really bad shape right now. Economically, it just it's in tatters. Uh, no countries are rushing to rebuild its cities, which are in ruins. Um, the people are are struggling to get the basic necessities, and you start to see the sort of the, the ruling class in Syria feeling a lot of pressure, um, uh, and the Assads are feeling that pressure too. And because of that pressure, one has to hope that maybe there will be an opportunity for some kind of, of political solution that's eluded us for so long. Um, it would probably have to involve uh, Assad leaving, and, and no one really is sure how that would happen and who would replace him. But if, again, if the Russians feel motivated, if they're tired of having to prop Syria up and they want to see things move on, they want to see an international accord that would allow uh, funds into the country to rebuild Syria and keep it from being this just festering mess, um, then maybe they would see it in their interest to, to try to engineer uh, new leadership for, for the country. Um, but that is the one kind of hopeful thing that one could be one, that could be said about a a conflict that seems to be frozen, that uh, there's, you know, a rebel enclave in the Northeast, there's more in the, the Kurds, uh, uh, Syrian Kurds hold parts of the of the East and, and the Southeast, and and all those lines seem to be frozen right now. And around them, you see ISIS trying to pop up again, um, particularly in areas that the Syrians control. There's, there's a, a high level of violence just in the last month during Ramadan. Uh, an incredible number of, of small attacks. So they're trying to regain their footing. Um, and so uh, I guess the other thing to be said about it is that unfortunately there is a, an important role for us that we have to be present on the ground in small numbers, I think, just to kind of keep things, keep the sides from tearing each other up, keep from the Iranians from having their way in the South. But more importantly, there needs to be diplomatic engagement. Some massive international effort to try to somehow solve this problem in a way that will, will allow the, the country to be re rebuilt and uh, and just to this this awful vacuum uh uh security vacuum and this sort of stateless area and, and parts of the country um to go away because that's just that's just a huge problem waiting to happen i think i know we're out of time but i really enjoyed this i thank everybody for sticking with us to the end and uh, for all the great questions, you're clearly a very informed, um, very intelligent audience, and, and that's the best kind from my point of view. So I thank you all. And if anyone, I'll just to mention, uh, if anyone wants a, a book plate, which is a sort of an autographed um, sort of decal, essentially, that I would sign uh, so you could put inside the book if you get it. Uh, if you could let either Shannon or Meg know, and I'd be happy to send that to you at my expense. So uh, very, very pleased to do that if you want it. And I just thank you again all for your, for your time and your attention.